if the word go forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike. This is preeminently the time to speak the truth, the whole truth, frankly and boldly. History doesn't have to be boring, buttoned up, or inaccessible. And it certainly didn't end in 1945. It belongs to all of us, and we share and add to it every day. Welcome to the History of Go-Go podcast, where I interview interesting guests, cover a motley crew of topics, and it's a place where you can sit, think, and drink all at the same time. I'm your host, Rob Mellon. There is a hydrogen bomb that's aimed at you right now. We live in a perilous era. There are 15,000 nuclear weapons on the planet, and the nine nuclear weapon states are in conflict with each other. The United States and North Korea, NATO and Russia, India and Pakistan. We're just one misunderstanding, one mistake, or one fanatic politician away from a nuclear conflict. My guest today is writer Steve Schenken. He has done many things in his career, including working for the National Audubon Society and writing screenplays for movies. He even made his own feature film, a comedy called A More Perfect Union. He moved to New York and earned a name for himself writing history textbooks for an educational publicity company. But in 2008, he wrote his last textbook and became a full-time author. He has written numerous books with a special emphasis on writing books for young people. His list of works includes Lincoln's Grave Robbers, The Port Chicago 50, Most Dangerous, Daniel Ellsberg and the Secret History of the Vietnam War, The Notorious Benedict Arnold, A True Story of Adventure, Heroism and Treachery, and Bomb, The Race to Build and Steal the World's Most Dangerous Weapon. His books have won numerous awards and recognitions, including the Newberry Honor, the Washington Post Book of the Year, and he was a finalist for the National Book Awards. His most recent work is Fallout, Spies, Super Bombs, and the Ultimate Cold War Showdown. And that will be our topic of discussion today. Of the book, Bookhorn Magazine states, Shane can crafts an epic narrative with a large cast of characters, far-flung settings, multiple plot strands, and rising suspense. Further evidence that one of our best nonfiction writers is also one of our best storytellers. And we are very pleased to have the award-winning writer and storyteller with us today. Welcome, Steve. Hello. Hi, Rob. Thanks for having me on. You're very welcome. Now, this is something I'm sure you've been asked on many occasions. And although there are several years between your book, Bomb, and your recent release, Fallout, is this new book, though, almost a sequel to your award-winning book, Bomb? Yes, is the short answer. (laughs) I mean, sequel is just kind of a strange word for nonfiction, I guess, uh, because really I'm just following time. Sure, yeah. (laughs) In the sense that Bomb is set during World War II, so naturally Fallout is set during the Cold War. But yeah, definitely, it's it's a very similar structure and theme and and style. So I I would say yes. Steve, it is tradition here to accompany the conversation with a special brew. Today, we have Thespian Espionage India Pale Ale from the Weathered Ground Brewery of Cool Ridge, West Virginia. Occasionally, a dramatic experiment becomes a brew house favorite, and that's exactly what happened with Thespian Espionage. This IPA is bursting with citrus dialogue and tropical melodies while maintaining a superior drinkability that ends with a standing ovation of flavor. Which is why they say at Weathered Ground, there are no small beers, only small batches. Remember, the best way to enjoy an episode is with one of our featured brews. I would also like to ask you to subscribe to the podcast. Subscribing is the only way to get the new material right away. And to the growing legion of listeners and supporters from more than 80 countries and thousands of cities across the globe, thank you. And now, I raise my Thespian Espionage IPA very high. And to the men and women who guided us through the troubled times of the Cold War, ensuring that it never got too hot, I say cheers. 
Now, I really enjoyed reading the story of Jimmy Bozart at the beginning of the book. It's just absolutely fascinating. It almost seems impossible to believe. Can you retell that story for us? Well, that's what I look for. I mean, stories that are stranger than fiction, but true is, is gold to me. So yes, absolutely. And I look really hard and try different scenes for opening scenes, trying to find just the right one. So yeah, all right, Jimmy Bozart, this, going back to 1953, this, I just feel like this would be the start of a Spielberg movie or something. It's a kid doing a, on a paper route, you know, can't you just see that? <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, the Brooklyn Eagle. So he's, he's collecting, it's a Friday after school, he's collecting for his paper route. It's 35 cents a week, something like that. And he goes up to the, the top floor of an apartment building, just such a good opening scene, kind of walking up this creaky stairway to the top floor. And two women up there, their retired teachers, give him a handful of change. He's, he's expecting about 50 cents because they're good tippers. And it feels like about right, but he doesn't want to look at it because it's rude to look in front of you know your customers. And he turns and starts down the stairs, but trips and the coins fall from his hand. And they kind of clank and spin on the dark stairs. And one of them incredibly breaks open a nickel. And he, he, he's scrambling to pick everything up. And he notices this nickel has broken open and is hollow. And not only that, inside is a tiny piece of film. And he holds the film up to a little bit of light coming in from a window. And there seems to be some sort of secret code on it, a, a series of five-digit numbers. So, I mean, that's just a great opening. What's happened, we find out very quickly, it's not a spoiler, is that he has indeed stumbled into a Soviet spy ring in New York City. And it's just a great way to set the stage for the kind of story it's going to be. But like you say, with a, with a very cinematic scene that just feels made up, it probably would be considered too far-fetched if, it were, if you put it in a thriller, you know, a fictional thriller. So is Rudolph Abel involved in that story? Yes, he's the guy. And again, not a spoiler. He, you know, that's like page three that we find. <laughs> and then uh, Jimmy, the whole opening scene is, is darkly comic because, yes, it's about spies in the Cold War. And, and uh, the, the Rosenbergs were executed like two days before this happened. So people are thinking about spies and they know the stakes. And he didn't know what to do with it. So the opening scene, in addition to this kind of moment, this really cinematic moment where he picks up this coin and looks at this code, then what do you do? And it becomes comic. He goes home to his dad. who has no idea what to do. He says, I don't know. Go, go give it to a, a cop. You know, I don't know. And he said, ah, OK. And he runs to his friend's house, this girl in his junior high who, whose father is a detective. But the guy's not home. And he says, ah, all right, I'm just going to go play stickball then. So he goes out and he's playing stickball. But when the dad comes home, the cop, the daughter tells him, you know, oh, this, this red haired kid came over and he had some sort of secret message inside a nickel and uh, but he's out uh, he left i don't know and then the police officer was in a panic he said i got it that's that sounds important that he's chasing little jimmy all over brooklyn looking for looking for his hollow nickel and, but but very quickly after that it winds up in the hands of the fbi but it, and it took them they realized that this was a, a soviet code it had all the hall, hallmarks of a of a one-time pad code which was a system the soviets used it was totally unbreakable but they didn't find the, the spy who was Rudolph Abel for a couple of years. You know, the interesting thing is I've done a few other podcasts and similar topics. And what you find is the Americans are significantly behind the Soviets and espionage at the beginning. So this is just frightening when things like that happen because we are really behind. Scientifically, at this point, we're a little bit ahead in some regards. But in espionage and in spycraft, we're definitely behind the Soviets. Yes, they were great at it, for one thing. I mean, they had pulled off what I still consider the greatest that the greatest in terms of most impactful piece of espionage in history, you have to say, was the spies they got inside Los Alamos during World War II. And they're, yeah, they're continuing that. Of course, they had this massive advantage that, that a, a Russian immigrant can show up in New York City. An American immigrant can't show up in Moscow and just move into an apartment and say, I'm a retired photographer or something. It doesn't work. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so that's a big advantage. But yeah, they were very serious about it and very, very good at it. You have a quote at the very beginning of your book by world chess champion Mikhail Tal. And I'm just going to quote it because it's a great quote. And then, you know, maybe we can have a little conversation around it. And this is what he says. He says, quote, you must take your opponent into a deep, dark forest where two plus two equals five. And the path leading out is only wide enough for one. First of all, why did you use this quote at the beginning of your book? And why do you believe it encapsulates the Cold War struggle? 
Yeah, thank, I love that quote so much too. Isn't that a great quote? That's awesome. <laughs> Isn't it great? It's, it's so evocative. Yeah, and, and frightening almost. I mean, he was talking about chess. He was famously bold attacker in chess who would do these bewildering moves, queen sacrifices, and things that that would pay off. You know, ten moves later. So he was really just talking about chess. <laughs> but the the chess analogies to the Cold War are inevitable, both in contemporary sources and now looking back on it, you just can't. It is a three-dimensional, four-dimensional chess game really played out in real time using the, the globe as as the board. And that's how leaders saw it. That's how they played it, although it wasn't the game at all, of course. So that's inevitable. And, and it's just also coincidentally during the pandemic, I just got really into watching chess videos at lunchtime. You know, you had <laughs> something to do when you're stuck in your room all day, every day. My dad taught me chess when I was a kid. He was a member of the local chess club and so forth. So I'm familiar with some of those characters. Okay. Yeah. We'll have to play sometime. Then. Yeah. <laughs> so that so that's where I came across the quote. And but of course, in the early 1960s, when this story takes place, the Soviets were absolutely dominant at chess. And and that's not irrelevant. I mean, Khrushchev was a fan. He wasn't a masterful player himself, apparently, but he was a fan and certainly used his principles. You can see him using the principles in the way he manipulated or attempted to manipulate world events, especially facing off against Eisenhower and Kennedy. How significant was the U-2 spy plane incident involving Gary Powers in May of 1960? It just seems like terrible timing for U.S.-Soviet relations. I would argue hugely significant, a major turning point. Right before that, Eisenhower, who was right at the very, very end of his presidency and really his public life, and he knew that, and he really wanted one last accomplishment, which would be to achieve some sort of detente, lessening of tensions with the Soviets. And he had, was making progress. Eisenhower and, and Khrushchev had met, and Eisenhower was actually invited to the Soviet Union, where no U.S. president had ever been. They were even making him a golf course, which was a big deal, because they don't, they don't know from golf over there. You know. But they said, ah, oh, this guy likes golf, we'll make him a golf course. <laughs> so the YouTube shootdown just blew all of that up. It happened just at the exact same time as Eisenhower was about to leave for Paris for this really, what was hoped to be a really significant breakthrough summit with Khrushchev. But the U.S. was spying on the Soviets. Like you said, the Soviets were better at, at these in-person, you know, on the ground spies, but the Americans had more money to spend on technology. And one of the things that we did was build this incredible plane, the U-2, which could fly 70,000 feet, which the military and CIA assured the pilots was high enough that it could never be shot down. But, um, you know, of course, these stories never work out the way they're supposed to. And this pilot was shot down over Russia. And it was just a huge story and hugely embarrassing, partly because Eisenhower lied about it to the whole world for several days. He didn't know the pilot was still alive. And again, Khrushchev just played chess with him. He completely manipulated Eisenhower into a corner. And uh, so it was, it was a huge deal. And it really blew up the path that they were on, which may or may not have led to anything significant, but may have led to a real lessening of tensions and a slowdown in the arms race. And then things just went the other direction completely, straight ahead toward the Cuban Missile Crisis. And it was those two years that I really focus on and follow. Now, great stories like yours, they always have a really good villain. There's a few in your book, obviously. <laughs> you talked about Khrushchev, for example. Villains are best when they're complex. So if you take the Marvel Universe, you know, Thanos is He's a complex character. Nikita Khrushchev isn't even your typical Soviet premier, let alone your typical villain. Does it help your story that you have a, a complicated character like Khrushchev? Yes, yeah, so much. I just did a, a school visit this week and I was talking to you know, middle school kids and they said, well, why do you need? And I said something about just what you just said. I need a really good villain. And I said, why? And, and But when I asked them to think about their favorite stories, whether it's anything from Harry Potter to Star Wars. Of course, the villain is in many scenes, you're just happy when they come on screen or on the page because it's, it's exciting to read. You, you're, you're not rooting for them, probably, but it's still, you're still happy when they appear because you know it's going to be exciting. And so if you're like me, you're trying to write a thriller, you know, any book on how to write a thriller, they'll always tell you you really need to spend a lot of time on your, on your villain. And like you said, make them not a two-dimensional, just dangerous, evil person, but really a complex interesting character. And you couldn't ask for more than Khrushchev. And I agree, especially compared with Joseph Stalin. He's not a monster. He's a really interesting guy. I, you know, grew up incredibly poor, working from a very, very young age in terrible conditions. 
a true believer in communism and its powers to to give people like him a better a better chance at life and a true believer that he his side would would win the cold war right we will bury you as he famously said and he claimed of course that that meant gently <laughs> over time yes yeah <laughs> that our system really is better than yours by all accounts he believed that at least up until the very end of his life and so yeah fascinating a very smart guy behind the scenes i mean i, I spent one chapter just describing his unlikely rise to power after Stalin's death, there was this power struggle inside the Kremlin and these insiders, and nobody really expected this Khrushchev character to come out on top. I mean, he was there in the inner circle, but wasn't considered the front runner by any means. But it's fascinating to watch him outmaneuver his rivals and come out on top. And yeah, I mean, you said it perfectly. You just need, for a story like this, you need a villain character that's that good. And I think he almost looks more two-dimensional than he is because it's so easy to caricature. He was kind of he was short and chubby and bald and, and wore terrible fitting suits and was, you know, throwing tantrums and right. he acted and looked like a Bond villain before Bond villains existed. So it's really art imitating life in this case. But in real life, I think he was a fascinating character. Well, I'm peering over your shoulder, if that's okay, and I see Benedict Arnold behind you. Yeah. I'm just wondering if we're talking about complicated characters, complex people. Benedict Arnold's definitely one. He, of course, would be a villain in that book, I'm assuming. (laughs) But then you also have these clandestine nature of his operations and the things that he's doing. Was there any sort of connective tissue, at least, or did you find similarities between, even though they're in two completely different time periods, between fallout in that espionage during the Cold War and then what you had done with Benedict Arnold. Hmm. That's, a, that's an original question. And I love trying to think of those connections over time. I mean, I guess one connection is I do love complex villains. The antihero kind of character is always the most interesting one. I, I, I've always argued for years, because I started out many, many years ago writing history textbooks. And I tried to always tried to get in Benedict Arnold just because he's the opposite of boring and kids think history is boring. So I would always try to get him in and they would always cut him out and say, ah, we don't have room for that. For that reason alone, that he's a fascinating character, but also with Arnold, this definitely, I would, I found this to be true. I mean, when you get to know somebody and you get to know their origin story and the things they're up against and what they were trying to do, you may become, you may even root for them or you may at least become sympathetic with them. And I think that that, that really helps the story even if they are the villain. And, I, and that, that is a, a good insight, I think, in terms of a connection between, between villains over time and place, that, that if you can understand them, and I'm not talking about monstrous characters, but if you can understand these complex figures, it really just makes the story that much richer. How fun was it to juxtapose Nikita Khrushchev with John F. Kennedy? That had to be an enjoyable part of the writing process. It really is, and I... You, Fun is a good is a good word. I mean, I really want they say you can taste love and cooking, you know, that sort of thing. And I think writing is the same way. And especially if I'm trying to win over teenagers who who are bored by their textbooks, it's fun is really important. I mean, it's not just about like I say all the time, I'm not a health food salesman. I don't want, I'm not just telling you this stuff because you're supposed to know it. And that is fun. I mean, what a what a show that you love love again, the chess analogy, you love a rivalry. And these people couldn't be more different. I mean, we, you have Khrushchev growing up working in a mine when he's 10 years old, and Kennedy growing up one of the richest kids in America, everything handed to him, beautiful looking guy, great clothes, great life, everything, young. And of course, Khrushchev was well, well aware of that. And Can't not be aware of it. There's no way, there's no way he could avoid it. <laughs> yeah, you can't avoid it. I mean, they, they just opposite in every single possible way, except they're both students of history. They're both serious readers and they're very seriously ambitious people. So there are some interesting similarities too. I think that it's one of those things you just couldn't make up that they had this this one meeting early in Kennedy's presidency in in Vienna, Austria, that went disastrously for Kennedy because he was unprepared and, and, and he just got bossed around by a much more experienced politician. But fascinating scenes you know, one after another of them together in these diplomatic circles in Vienna. And, and, and then again, when you go behind the scenes, you see things like for Kennedy as being, a young, you know, early 40s, 
guy, he was in terrible health. Uh, he had to, he was taking all kinds of medication, getting shots for his back. He really could barely get through the day, as opposed to Khrushchev in his late 60s, who was like a shot out of a cannon. So, you know, the, the, again, the deeper you get, the, the more layers you see in the story. Kennedy's in a tough spot when he goes to Vienna. He'd only been president for a few months at that point. And not only that, he had the Bay of Pigs. Mm. Does that almost embolden Khrushchev at Vienna? I can just see Kennedy internally being just incensed that he has to walk into that room and confront Khrushchev with the fact of the failures of the Bay of Pigs looming over him. He's almost walking into a lion's den at that point. Yeah, I agree. I mean, according to all accounts, Khrushchev just couldn't believe that Kennedy, how he behaved during the Bay of Pigs. Not so much that he let it go forward, but that he didn't follow through. Once it was happening, he couldn't believe that the Kennedy would just stand back and let it fail. You know, he compared that, contrasted it with his the way he behaved in, in, in places like Hungary. You know, when, when there were rebellions, he sent in the tanks, you know. Right. Nobody cared. He didn't care about public image or, you know, what the world would say. And, and to him, that's how a strong leader behaved. And so he sensed weakness in Kennedy. He always claimed he liked him and didn't want to embarrass him. But I don't think he could help himself. You know, it was just a competitive situation. And he, sent, he did sense weakness. Well, you mentioned Hungary, for example, and the Soviets at this point. You have the fact that the Hungarians, many of them who had been fighting for their freedom, were calling out and expected the United States to come to their defense. When that doesn't happen, not only for the Hungarians, but the Soviets, they have to learn a lesson that the United States isn't going to be this global behemoth that's going to exert its power in every single corner, that there are limits. John F. Kennedy understands those limits, though, in Berlin. That seems to me where he says, I'm going to be determined in this circumstance. So what happens in that crisis, and how does Kennedy develop as a leader because of it? Yeah, that's a good question. It's amazing, by the way, that the, the drumbeat of, of crises and things that happen one after another. I mean, we think of of course, in our time, the news seems so dramatic, and it is. But I would argue this period of time was even more so. And maybe it's a good thing that there wasn't 24-hour news back then, because people's heads would have exploded from the, just one thing after another. But yeah, the Berlin Wall, this all goes on within a few months. The Berlin Wall goes up. And Kennedy really did have to take a stand there. I think that's where he started to turn things around, knowing where, where this could lead. Because by this point, both sides have hydrogen bombs and the rocket technology to deliver them anywhere in, in a matter of minutes. But he wouldn't let, he would not let West Berlin fall, even to the point of at least saying and making the maneuvers to, to show that he was willing to fight to prevent that from happening, to stand by the commitment of keeping West Berlin free. And that I definitely think definitely was a turning point for him. Well, you mentioned the hydrogen bomb, and there was a real race to that type of technology. The U.S. is first to get there. It's almost as if the United States is about five years ahead for the atomic bomb. And then when the hydrogen bomb is developed, they're only about six months ahead. That has to be truly disconcerting for Americans who are looking at the situation to say, you know, we're losing ground here. That has to add fear to this Cold War struggle. Yeah, the fear was just such a big part of it. I mean, the, the, yes, they were the Soviets. Absolute, their first atomic bombs were straight up copies of the American plutonium bombs, you know, designed at Los Alamos. But as, I, as Oppenheimer at the end of the war, he had this famous talk, which turned very nasty with Harry Truman, where he tried to tell Truman, you know, it's, it's not going to take them very long to catch up. They're, their physicists are just as good as we are. As soon as they're done fighting, they're, they're going to figure all this out really, really quickly. And Truman said, ah, no, I don't take them. For, he just didn't, didn't believe that, didn't respect them. But that's exactly what happened. Yeah, they figured out the hydrogen bomb really quickly. They were, never, they were never able to catch up, at least not for decades, in terms of the numbers of bombs they could produce, but it doesn't take that many, you know, and, they, and it, was, it was apparent to the world that they had the lead in the space race, which was one and the same with the arms race and the Cold War, because it was about rocket technology, and everyone knows they put Sputnik into space, and, and right in the same time period, incredibly, you just couldn't make this up. The same week of the Bay of Pigs was Yuri Gagarin's flight to space which was, you know, one of the great achievements in all of human history, but maybe not from the perspective of Americans in 1961, because it's, it means they have, they have better rockets than we do. So yeah, fear absolutely was, was just growing, I think, with each one of these events in this time period. 
October 1962, the United States discovers the Soviet Union is placing missiles in Cuba. It's often presented as this showdown between Kennedy and Khrushchev. But the reality is there are thousands of soldiers and sailors from both the United States and the Soviet Union all over the world, in many cases, not that far apart. And really, it only takes one of them (laughs) or one incident. It doesn't have to be a disagreement between Kennedy and Khrushchev. It can be a mishap out in the sea or in the land in Europe between soldiers from the opposing sides that could have ignited a war and maybe even a nuclear war. That's what's so scary about the crisis is that you do have, yes, you have this showdown between these superpowers and Kennedy and Khrushchev incredibly had no way of talking to each other. It took 12 hours sometimes to get a message diplomatically to get a message from, 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 you know, say the U.S. embassy in Moscow to Washington and, and the same from Washington to Moscow and no direct communication at all. But you had, I would argue, two very level-headed leaders who knew that in their minds, at least, this was not going to, they were not going to allow this to lead to World War III. Both had, had experiences in, in, in war, and we're not going to let that happen on their watch, theoretically. But at the same time, they continued to make these moves that escalated to the point where, just like you say, someone else could have started it or passed the point of no return. So yeah, I mean, and, and that's a big part of the, the last third of the book. The number of ways the war, World War III, could have started is just mind-boggling. The number of mistakes, the miscommunications, the things that happened, you just, again, could not make it up. But yeah, it could have, it could have easily happened outside the control of the two leaders. You had Soviet submarines in the Caribbean with nuclear torpedoes, which the Americans didn't know until 30, 40 years later. I mean, that's it was worse than people knew, and which is scary because a lot of people who were there at the time tell you how terrifying it was, but it was much worse than people knew. The Soviets had tactical nuclear missiles on the beaches in Cuba, which the local commanders were authorized to use if the Americans invaded. And how could that have happened? How could, you know, once one side uses a nuclear weapon, how does the other side not respond in kind? It's hard to see. So, yeah, it could have started in so many different ways. I've spent about 28 years in the Army, and for a time I was in aviation, and there was an old pilot, and he told me this story. He might have been in Germany, I think, at the time, or somewhere along that border, and he was in a Cobra, and he said there was an incident one time where he flies up, and he's head-to-head with a Russian aircraft, and they're just staring each other down. It's that close. You know, you're literally one incident like that from something much more substantive or major breaking out. Yeah, that's wow, what an interesting experience. But yeah, it's absolutely true. And there was there were these confrontations all over the place. And some of them were by mistake. The Russians in the middle of this crisis set up a sent off a rocket to to Mars or they hoped it was going to go to Mars. That's right. That's right. <laughs> they had this Korolev, this brilliant rocket scientist who was winning the space race right and left, you know, up to this point, but it blew up in the atmosphere and it looked on US radar screens, it really looked like missiles coming in. You know, you just couldn't make that up. Uh, why didn't someone tell him to wait? <laughs> wait a week to test uh, say, and, and by the same token the US was still flying what were really routine U-2 flights, not into Soviet territory anymore, but nearby to pick up, nothing to do with the crisis, just to pick up air samples to see what they were doing, the Russians were doing in terms of their own bomb tests. And they continued that during the crisis, not because, I think I don't think it was, it was deliberate, it's just nobody thought to say, maybe we could just wait on that. And one of these planes actually strayed into Soviet airspace, right at the height, right at the height of the missile crisis. So Yeah, these innocent mistakes by really intelligent people. Yeah, it's amazing how how easily it could have gotten out of control. I believe you had the opportunity to interview and speak with Sergei Khrushchev. Could you kind of tell his story and how he's interwoven into it, even though he was just the son of Nikita Khrushchev? I think Nikita actually bounced some ideas and stuff off of him. How interesting was it to have a conversation with him? That was fascinating. I think the most interesting conversation touch with history that I've had because yeah, he wasn't, you know, think of him as a player, but I actually do because he was in his twenties, but he was an accomplished guy. He was already a a young rocket engineer 
But he was living with his dad, you know, with his parents in Moscow, which is so great. So they were confidants. Khrushchev couldn't just spill his guts in the Politburo, you know, at a meeting. You know, he couldn't say, I'm really worried about it. It just didn't have that kind of relationship with the other high level political and military leaders. But he could go on walks with Sergei when they did. After work, they would walk and talk and he could say, yeah, I'm really worried about what's happening in Cuba. And uh, I just don't know how it's going to turn out. This isn't what I wanted. And Sergei wrote extensively about those conversations in his own writings. He actually came and lived in the U.S. for the last part of his life. So those are just valuable, invaluable Cold War sources. But I thought, I just really want, I, I really want to emphasize those scenes because they are scenes of them walking and talking, especially during the crisis. And was able through, actually had to do a little bit of detective work because he is, he, he, he actually died during the, during the pandemic. I think it was May or June of last year. But he was alive and living in Rhode Island. And, but I couldn't, I couldn't figure out how to get in touch with him. He's not like on Twitter or anything. You know? <laughs> so uh, it was through Gary Powers, the famous YouTube pilot's son, who I talked to. He actually had a, a phone number for, for Sergey. And I said, all right, I'll give it a try. And he was very gracious and very, very humble. He said, no, 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 I, I wasn't a player. I wasn't involved. I was just there. But I'm not so sure. You know, I'm not so sure because I think Khrushchev needed someone to talk to and confide in and get advice from. And so I'm just fascinated by the role that he played in the whole story. Well, I think it adds to it because of the nature of the political situation in the Soviet Union. Sometimes we think of the Soviet premier as a Stalin. And most of the time, that wasn't the case. It was a, a more shared power situation. Very complicated. I can see where he has to maneuver, then he makes enemies. Can't really trust the people around him, but he can trust his son. I think that's totally I think exactly right. Yeah, he has to go into these meetings with these other top leaders. And yeah, you're they could turn on you at any time. And if they all turn on you, you're, you're dead. You know, you're, it's over. And that's what they did to, to, to other leaders in the past that were, were, you know, Khrushchev had been a part of that, overthrowing guys like Beria, who, who really wanted and expected to take over after Stalin. And so, yeah, he, it was a constant struggle for power. Right. Which, which you're right. I never really understood that. I always thought of him as being a, that, that position as being a, a dictatorship in the sense of Hitler and Stalin. But it really wasn't at that point. So based on that and the research you've done and some of those conversations with Sergei Khrushchev and others, there are many opinions on how close we actually were to a nuclear war in October of 1962. What's your basic conclusion of that? How close do you think we actually were? I think close. I really do. I've, I've read the many opinions and I respect people who have given opinions all over the spectrum. But what I come back to over and over again, first of all, people like Robert McNamara, the U.S. Secretary of Defense, feels like it was really close. You know, he actually, in, in these scenes that seem like a, some sort of comedy, but it's not really, but he would, you know, go to these hotels and have conferences with Fidel Castro 40, 50 years later, and they would sit down and drink a beer and say, what were you thinking? What were you thinking? And the Soviets would come to these meetings too. And they all concluded that they just really didn't understand each other. They didn't know militarily what the others had or how close they came to using what they had. It's not that anyone wanted to fight. I don't think that's true, although it's, it's possible that Castro did. That's a very controversial point because he seemed intent on going down in flames if, if it was going to come to that. But the Americans and the Russians were not interested in fighting World War III. But what strikes me is that it was how close things could have come to getting out of control. And Kennedy always came back to, it was a quote about from World War I that he came back to. He was a student of, of history and noted that that war, amongst others, nobody really intended to fight exactly. We just kind of stumbled into it. And there was a famous quote from early on where two German leaders were looked at each other and said, how did this happen? And the other said, if only one knew. And could that have happened again to, to cause World War III? And then my argument is, yes, it really could have, except maybe there wouldn't be anyone left to ask those questions afterward. There are U.S. military leaders, though. Some are mentioned in your book. They are very hawkish in the early 1960s. LeMay and Power, for example, 
Did General Power, the commander of the U.S. Strategic Air Command, did he actually say, look, at the end of this war, if there are two Americans and one Russian, then we win? That concept is frightening as well. Yes, it's terrifying. And he did say that. And it's terrifying. I'm trying to, I don't know if there any other word for it, but he and LeMay were famous for making statements like that. You could argue now they're being bombastic. They're not speaking literally. These guys had experienced war. They had no illusions about what it would be like. But they were very hawkish. You're right. And they believed, rightly or wrongly, you could argue, I suppose, they believed that, that it was inevitable that we were going to fight the Soviets at some point. Because in the history of the world, that's just always what happened. When you have these rivals gearing up to fight each other, when did, when did you ever have them just back down at some point and not settle it violently? And I guess their point was that if it's going to happen, let, let's do it now while we're ahead, which is coldly logical, I suppose. Right, yeah. But it would not have worked out well for anybody. And all you could say is that they were, they were just talking tough. But during the missile crisis, there, there's no doubt that the, most of the military leaders, especially the ones in these meetings with Kennedy in the White House, they didn't want to launch missiles, but they did want an airstrike. They wanted to go in militarily and take out those missiles, the Russian missiles in Cuba. And it's just hard to see how that could have happened without escalation from there. You know, one of the things, and I know you've probably listened to a lot of these conversations that are now available between Kennedy and others, and maybe you can describe that and the reason why we have those audio files anyway. This is what bothers me. Obviously, the content can be scary, like we were just talking about that comment from General Power. But over and above that, it's the way that they're talking to Kennedy, because I've spent a good part of my life as an army officer, if I'm in the Oval Office and I'm speaking to the commander in chief, I'm going to do so with deference. And a lot of times it's the tone of their voice that they're taking. It's like, why are they talking to the president like that? And then what kind of power do they think they have that allows them to do that? That's what I hear when I listen to those interactions. That's what's disconcerting to me personally. That's an interesting take on it, you know, with your experience. But yeah, no doubt about that. LeMay, he just didn't respect Kennedy and considered him this pampered kid. Although Kennedy had been a, you know, had his own war experiences during Second World War, but those those recordings are priceless. There's nothing like them in in all of history. Famously, infamously, Richard Nixon recorded his White House conversations, and it ended up, of course, getting him kicked out of office because he recorded himself committing crimes, which is it turned out not to be such a great idea, but. So people, people know about that, but they don't know that, that every president, I think starting with FDR was the first one, but Kennedy had a system where he could flick a switch under his seat in the cabinet room, you know, where he always sat under the table. There was a little switch. Only Bobby Kennedy knew about this. And it would just start recording, start rolling. And he just wanted everyone on record. This was well before the missile crisis. He just wanted everything on record. You could say, oh, I'm going to use it for my memoir. But it was really that, you know, in case someone said something that, that he disagreed with, he could prove you know, who was telling the truth and had hours and hours and hundreds of hours of these tapes. And incredibly, it's all public now. Most of it's been digitized even. If you go to the Kennedy Library website, you'll be able to find links to these missile crisis recordings. And they're kind of hard to follow sometimes because a lot of people are talking at once, but there are transcripts too, entire books of transcripts. And so that's an insight into this period of time, these few days when the world was on the edge. I can't think of anything like it during any other historical situation. Even recently, we don't have this kind of access to what happened in the White House a year ago, you know? So that's fascinating stuff. And yeah, in terms of the tone that some of these leaders took with Kennedy, it is shocking. And I'm interested to hear your take on it with this really impressive experience that you have, that you would find it shocking too. Let's say you just completely disrespect the person. It doesn't matter once you're in that environment, you have to defer to the person just because of the position that President Kennedy had. So irrespective of your personal opinion, even in closed doors, that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you were out in an open and public environment or if you're in the Oval Office behind closed doors, the conduct of an Army officer should be exactly the same. Yeah, you could certainly make that case. I mean, at that point, the U.S. Air Force is the greatest most powerful institution in the history of the world. You could certainly say that without any hesitation. And then they see this kid come along who's, you know, you know, again, not totally respecting his background. And the same for people like McNamara 
you know, not totally respecting them and saying, we know more than you guys do. We're, you guys don't know what it's going to take to win against this type of adversary. And Kennedy was really aware that he, what he was up against. I mean, there was, there were political factors involved. The Republicans were killing him for being quote soft on Cuba and was under this tremendous pressure from LeMay and others to find a military solution to this crisis. And and I don't, I'm not saying by any means that his behavior was, you know, exemplary during this whole crisis. Sure. And that's very controversial and very interesting. This is one of the reasons I got into history was studying things like the missile crisis and, and the decision making in these times and who was right and what could they have done. But I think one thing he did do that's admirable is he really stood up to that pressure and said, no, I'm going to make my own. I'm president. I don't care if you don't respect me. I'm still going to make my own decision on this. You're not going to pressure me into launching this attack. You brought up Castro, and of course, he's an integral part of this story. The description you gave, though, of Castro's view of a potential conflict in 1962 reminded me actually of Hitler, and and I'll explain in what context. At the conclusion of World War II, many people questioned Hitler's decision-making and are perplexed by it, basically. It's confusing because some make the assumption that Hitler made those decisions to win the war. But in reality, maybe he did understand the system was failing and decided if Germany couldn't win, then their fate should be complete destruction. So in Castro's case, he saw himself as one with the state, that he was, in essence, Cuba itself. And if they didn't win the struggle that would come, then they deserve destruction. That comparison... And there's one really specific thing. I'm not, yeah, I don't, I'm certainly not going to compare the two again. You have your monsters of history, and then you have these controversial figures like Castro, who clearly did some very bad things, but are not at that level. In this case, though, there was a famous moment in the, at the height of the crisis where he called the Soviet ambassador into his apartment and dictated a letter. He said, you got to, I, I want to write a letter to Khrushchev right now, two in the morning. And it was, by all accounts, completely unhinged. And he, I'm sure he was terribly stressed out and hadn't been sleeping and under all this pressure. Certainly thought of himself, like you said, as the state. He was, you know, it's his country. And he said things like, if you, Nikita, if you think that the Americans are going to, if this if war is inevitable, then let's start it. Let's not wait for them to hit us because we know they're more powerful than we are. Let's not be the victims. Let's be the aggressors. And this was hap- this conversation was happening in Spanish, and the ambassador apparently was was quite fluent in Spanish, but he wanted to go over it. And, Wait, what are you trying? You're not saying you want us to start the war, are you? And he said, No, not exactly. But if it's inevitable, yes. And this was one of the things. This transcript again. There was no instant way to send this kind of thing. It took almost a day to reach Nikita's apartment in Moscow, and when he got it, he was just horrified. Again, it just just what you were saying before. This is another way things could get out of control. I think Khrushchev realized I, I'm not I'm not in control anymore. We just sent all these weapons to Cuba, and theoretically, my generals are in charge of them. But I can't. I don't have my finger on the button anymore. And it was one of the things that really, really influenced him to try to defuse, even if it meant retreating and, and accepting defeat, which he really ultimately did. There's a part in your book, and in fact, I think it's part two, and it's entitled The Hedgehog and the Pants. Could you explain the meaning of that? Because that's an interesting part of the book as well. Yeah, I love giving these titles that, that you don't quite know what they mean. You actually don't find out what that means until the very last sentence, I think, of, the, of that section of the second section out of three of the book. But I, I can certainly tell you it's not too big of a spoiler. <laughs> but yeah, Khrushchev, again, going back to him, he's always trying to think of that next chess move. And came up with this idea, turned out to be a terrible one, of putting missiles in Cuba. And apparently it came about, he's walking along the sea. He had this nice villa, you know, along the sea. So he didn't believe, you know, in communism too much. You know, he had all kinds of houses <laughs> all over the place, as all these guys always do eventually. That's how it always works. But yeah, so he's walking along the sea and he's looking across. He can't see physically, see Turkey from from where he is, but he... But he knows it's right across the water where the Americans now have another military base with their rockets and missiles there. And he's thinking, this is, I'm hemmed in here. They've got them in Germany and all over the place. Why can't I put my missiles in their backyard? And he's turned to his defense minister and said something like, let's throw a hedgehog down Uncle Sam's pants. 
which is just a great line <laughs> of dialogue. So when you're writing nonfiction, that's gold to find something like that. But yeah, throwing a hedgehog down Uncle Sam's pants. That was his analogy for what he was trying to do in Cuba. I'm looking at a few more items that you have on the wall behind you. You have a Cold War era poster, really cool looking, that's got the name of your book on it. But you also have the famous duck and cover poster. Now, obviously, we look at those drills today as complete foolishness. You know, there's no way a simple school desk is going to protect anyone from the effects of a nuclear warhead. It's just simply propaganda. And we know that today. Do you think they realized that back in the 1960s? If we take Kennedy, for example, he's a very smart man. He has to know these are false security measures. So what he's really doing is attempting to give the American people some reassurances so they have some control over their lives. But deep down, Kennedy has to know this is simple propaganda just to prevent hysteria. 100% correct. And each president in turn realized this Eisenhower was the first one, I think, because it became a reality, duck and cover, in the 1950s. And there was even a, they would practice evacuations. There was secret, you know, bunkers inside mountains in Pennsylvania and West Virginia and places where the president and the Pentagon could retreat to in case of war. And he just had no heart for this kind of thing. He said it, privately, he would say, this is, this is just stupid. I mean, it's not, none of it's going to work. You know, but he would go out and tell people to build fallout shelters. And Kennedy did the same thing and started off kind of gung-ho about it. And then, yeah, just just within a year or so, realizing the reality of, of the futility of it, that this is not going to this is not going to help. The only hope we have is to prevent the war. If it happens, it's finished. You know, we're all going down. You're not going to survive because you have you know, a place to hide for a couple of weeks with a, some, some bottled water. It's just, that's not going to do it. Well, and the interesting thing is we look at that now and it looks like the 50s and 60s, but I went to high school in the 80s and we still did those types of things in the 80s. They still had those types of drills that they would roll out every once in a while. I also remember where things would come out and say, okay, you live this far away from a known silo the wind's going to blow this direction and you'll have 25 minutes or you'll have 35 minutes. And in that 35 minutes, you can build up soil around your house. Like that's impossible. But they would say things like that. That was the eighties, not the sixties. Yeah. I had similar experiences and and that's part of what makes this story compelling to me is that is at least being alive for part of the cold war, the end of it. I mean, I was alive for most, for, for, you know, since the sixties, but Living in the 80s, yeah, high school in the 80s, definitely. I, I can relate to that and and thinking it's going to happen. I mean, that's just what everyone said. It's going at some point we're going to have this war. And people always, no matter where you lived in the country, there was some reason why you were, you, you're you going to be, you're screwed, basically. Because whether you're <laughs> near a military base, a big city, whatever. And I live near New York City. So everyone had something. And I've talked to people my age, you know, over the years, they always had some thing near them that they were sure was a target and probably was because at this point, the Soviets had thousands, literally thousands of warheads. So, yeah, I, I remember that fear and remember the age of kind of the nuclear apocalypse day after type movies that came on TV. Yeah, absolutely. And that became a whole genre of things, which I was both terrified of and frightened. Fascinated with. Uh, but I was also fascinated. Right, yeah, yeah, right, yeah. yeah, totally fascinated. Because this could, wow, this could be us. We'll be living in the woods. It's kind of exciting. It's terrible, but it's kind of exciting. Yeah. But yeah, I, it, it, it does become personal. That's interesting when history kind of crosses over from just before you were born to stuff you remember. Not only that. I remember it was a topic of conversation or concern throughout the 1980s. But today, it's not as if those missiles are all gone. They're all basically still in the inventory for the most part, even though there's been some reduction and so forth. (laughs) The reality is the technology is much greater now. The bombs are probably much more precise now than they were in the 80s. But they don't even mention it. It doesn't even come as a topic of conversation. It's like, Something of a, you know, a long gone past or something. That's a good point. I mean, we just don't talk about it anymore. I mean, in a way, is it good in a way that we're... Because it hasn't gone away. It, it hasn't gone away. 
but it hasn't gone away. We're not worried about it day to day, partly because we're worried about so many other things, partly because, like you say, there has been a, a, a step back from the cliff in terms of the numbers of weapons, especially that the U.S. and the Russians have, which is where they mostly were anyway. Yeah, the only place you really hear about it is in terms of Iran or North Korea or new new nuclear powers, which would, of course, be very destabilizing and dangerous. Right. But yeah, eventually we're going to have to solve the problem entirely and just continue to, to get rid of these things. But you're right. It, ha- it just hasn't, hasn't been a subject. Of- it's just not in the consciousness. It, Talk? Yeah, not at all. It was completely in our consciousness in the 80s. It's not even mentioned now. It's like it doesn't exist, but it really does. Now we grew up in a different time than kids are today. So. Yes. And you're right. They have other concerns that, that we didn't have as well. So the last question I have for you, you dealt with a lot of topics that people know a great deal about, but when you did your research, were there some specific things that you were truly shocked by? Yes. I mean, I'm always looking for the lesser known things, whether it's not shocking, but just terribly entertaining, like Jimmy Bozart's story. I I love that. I love how less famous people get involved in, in history. I love following Gary Powers, the YouTube pilot into history. You know, he starts off as a very young Air Force pilot, you know, in an Air Force base in Georgia and was recruited in a scene that just seems straight out of James Bond, where he was told, well, he was picked because he was a good pilot. He was young, he was a good pilot, had high security rating clearance. And so they said, hey, you're interested in a job? You know, if so, go to this motel <laughs> outside the base, knock on <laughs> cabin number one, the door of cabin number one. Just a great scene. So I love finding stuff like that. And I never, this is not the kind of stuff I ever learned about history. Again, to history, to me, at least up through mostly of, into high school, was just memorizing names and dates. And so when I find stories like that, it's just priceless to me. And I just know, I can't wait to tell them. And so that's really part of the fun of researching the story. And then, the, but the shocking side of it is all the stuff they didn't tell you, which is terrifying, which some of which we've talked about. There was also like a famous, this was, just, I think, three days after Kennedy was inaugurated, a U.S. plane with two hydrogen bombs accidentally, well, it crashed, it lost control, and the two bombs actually fell out and landed in, in North Carolina. And one of them came very, very, very close to detonating. And stories like that, boy, I mean, I would have been interested, again, going back to high school in the 80s, I would have been interested, I would have been terrified by stories like that, but at least I wouldn't have been bored. In history class, <laughs> so that's the that's the good side of, of doing this research. You just you could never be bored. It's endlessly fascinating. And thankfully, North Carolina is still there. <laughs> it's fine. Yeah, it worked out fine. <laughs> could have been worse, <laughs> but it's still there. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you for your time. The book is fascinating, and what I enjoyed about it, it is easy to read, and these stories are phenomenal. They're just phenomenal stories, and it's true history. Thank you, Rob. I really appreciate it. It's really insightful questions. It's been a fun conversation. We'll have a great holiday season and we'll have to get together maybe and talk about Benedict Arnold. Yes. Oh, anytime, anywhere. My guest today was award-winning writer and storyteller, Steve Schenken. And if you would like to get his new book, Fallout, Spies, Super Bombs, and the Ultimate Cold War Showdown, just click on the link in the description below. Of Fallout, the book list says... A complicated thriller that intercuts action with the deafness of a Hollywood blockbuster. Our featured brew was Thespian Espionage IPA from the Weathered Ground Brewery of Cool Ridge, West Virginia. And if you liked our talk today, please share this episode with a friend. And if you want more information on books and authors, like the History of Go-Go Facebook page. The music was provided by the great North Carolina band Bones Fork. And if you would like to check out their brand new album, Beautiful Circle, simply click on the link. It's in the description below as well. Once again, to our growing list of listeners, I have to say thank you. There are many more great episodes on the way. So join us again next time when we talk, think, and drink on History of Go-Go. Most of it is done by Americans to Americans, thanks to lack of moral standards. As I mentioned before, uh, exposure to true information does not matter anymore. A person who was demoralized is unable to assess true information. The facts tell nothing to him. 
uh, even if I shower him with information, with, with authentic proof, with documents, with pictures, even if I take him by force to the Soviet Union and show him concentration camp, he will refuse to believe it until he, he is going to receive a kick in, the, in his fat bottom. When a military boot crashes his balls, then he will understand, but not before that. That's the tragic of the situation of demoralization.